Thank you, Astrid. So I'm uh, honored to be with you today, and my longstanding um, friend and colleague in the work that we must do to fight for for civil rights and equal rights and dignity. Um, so Astrid, I'm so glad to be with you today. And, and to all of the leaders, I'm looking forward to our conversation. And on behalf of Joe Biden and myself, I wanna thank you um, for being here. This is a conversation so that we can listen and hear from you about what your life and experience has been like during this pandemic. Um, we have lots of plans about how we believe we can make things better, but if they will truly be better, it will be because we have listened to you and heard from you firsthand um, what your needs are and how we can meet those needs. So I wanna thank you um, for being here and I wanna actually, let's just start this conversation and in particular, I wanna hear from each of you and then I'll give you some of my thoughts about what, what our plans are and what we can do to, to support you. Thank you, Senator. And we'll start with uh, Dulce Valencia, uh, who is a uh, student, UNLV senior uh, and dreamer. Uh, briefly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Astrid. Hi, Senator. My name is Dulce Valencia. It's an honor to be here in your presence. Um, and thank you so much, first of all, for coming and listening to us, because we do need leaders who listen to us, and I appreciate you starting off by saying that you're gonna listen to us, so thank you for that. Um, I came to the state of Nevada when I was 12 years old as an undocumented immigrant. Um, I did not qualify for DACA, and it wasn't until 2015 when I was able to receive a work permit under a U-Visa program that I uh, started to feel a little bit of a sense of security in this country. All of that, of course, kind of went away when the current president took office, but, um, I have been able to um, continue my studies. I'm currently a senior, um, 92 days away from graduation, <laughs> and um, I'm majoring in theater studies. And um, I'm, as a dreamer, I've seen how much my immigrant community has been affected during these times, and I've also seen how the student community has been affected during these times. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, and thank you for being here. Thank you. We have Regina Sim Simmons uh, from Takatarian, owner. Hi. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and I, the same way, like, I want to thank you for hearing us. Um, I am an immigrant from Mexico City. I've been living in Las Vegas for 16 years. Um, I was able to achieve my American dream two years ago and open my own business. Um, I opened a vegan uh, Mexican restaurant. Um, and um, I'm like just so happy that you're here. You can hear all the struggles that we're going through uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have Eddie Ramos of the Carpenters Union uh, and Caesars Palace uh, uh, employee. Thank you to have you here again one more time and uh, welcome to Las Vegas. Uh, my name is Eddie Ramos who, who the I just represent right here the community, and I thank you to uh, come over here to listen to all the problems that we have. Uh, not only problems, but uh, we welcome you, and that way you can uh, share with us your experiences that you have uh, through your life, and then we'll be able to work that as a, uh, all together at the same time. And welcome. And we have our very own councilwoman for this precise location, uh, Councilwoman Olivia Diaz, Ward 3 City Council. Well, first and foremost, uh, Senator Harris, thank you for launching our Hispanic Heritage Month in such a meaningful way for our community. And Ward 3 will always receive you with open arms. Um, it's been a minute since we last saw you at the East Las Vegas Community Center, but we're happy that you made it back to Ward 3. And uh, I, I just wanted to share that I feel that your concern and your care are truly genuine for the Latino community. I remember going to do some advocacy around the census before it was supposed to take off. We had some severe um, concerns about the citizenship question, wanting to be incorporated. And I walked the halls of um, you know, the offices seeking Congress uh, people and senators. And I remember seeing your office and the signs outside saying, dreamers are welcome here. And when I saw that, I was like, 
that is so awesome. Um, you know, I just felt like, oh, I can walk in there and she's going to talk to me. So know that um, as a proud uh, Las Vegan, I was born and raised here, and I'm the first Latina city councilwoman for the city of Las Vegas. Um, but I have, I think, uh, been bestowed um, not just an honor, but a huge responsibility to look out for my constituency, which is over 60% Latino and Latinx. Um, and so I'm looking forward to renewed, a uh, newfound leadership that can be inclusive and embrace everybody, because I know that through the times we're all living, we're going to need that. My mother had many sayings, and one of them is she would say, you may be the first to do many things, make sure you're not the last. And you're living that kind of life, because I, I know your work of always leaving the door open and making it bigger so more people can walk through. So thank you. Thank you. So we're going to kick off. Um, Regina, um, you, you mentioned Thakotarian and the success of the past two years. How has COVID impacted um, not only your business, but your employee well-being um, and, and, and your customers? Well, it's been really hard for me and my family. Um, at the beginning, like, we have no information, like, no guidance of what to do. So we were terrified to go to work and then bring that virus back to my kids. So we, unfortunately, we were in that position that we needed to close. We closed the restaurant for two months until we got more information. Uh, when we were finally able to open, we could only open 50% capacity. That means 50% sales are down. So we had to get creative and find new ways to bring people in, but ways to make them feel comfortable. You know, you want their customers to feel safe to come to your place, but you also want your employees to feel safe to come to work because they haven't been working. They can't afford not to work for two weeks or whatever time they're sick. So it's definitely been very challenging, like getting creative either. We have to deliver food for customers now, or we have to do a curbside pickup, or do specials, or I mean, all the restaurants are in the same place right now. We definitely have to be uh, a lot, it's a lot more challenging and you have to get creative. Uh, because we don't want to close, we want to stay open, but the virus is still out there. There's, th this is not gone. This is still here. So we, we just have to make sure everyone's safe and there's leadership out there that help us go through this. Because without leadership, there, there's no way we're going to be able to go through this because this is not the end. And how do you feel going forward? What are the steps that you feel necessary for you to, to not only have a thriving business, but as you said, a safe one? Well, for the future, I definitely think, like for instance, at the beginning we got our PPP loan. That definitely helped us reopen the restaurant. We needed that money to open the doors and we needed that money to help the staff. The staff haven't been working for two months. They needed to, that money to survive. So we definitely need more help, more loans, more grants to, to help restaurants. Because as I said, this is still there. It, it's still hurting us every day. Customers are still scared to come to a restaurant. We have to take all the extra expense right now with all that masks for your employees, testing for your employees, uh, gloves, uh, sanitation stations, thermometers. Like, all these extra things that you have to do, we're happy to do, because as a community, we have to make these changes. But it's definitely, we need leadership. We need um, someone to, to guide us and, and help us go through this. And the restaurant industry needs help. We need help to, to pass this time. Um, thank you. And I'm really, I, I look forward to coming to your restaurant. <laughs> I try to be vegan before six, sometimes. <laughs> and then steak. <laughs> um, but to your point, um, Joe and I have talked extensively about this. Because to reopen, you hit every point on the head. In order for businesses to be able to reopen, 
the customer has to feel comfortable. Because you can open the doors back up, to your point, after two months of being closed. But if the customer doesn't feel comfortable, then it's still going to impact your bottom line, literally. So part of our plan is what we can do in terms of providing paid leave uh, for your employees, providing PPEs for you. Um, we have, a, a, and part of the funding would include, for example, plexiglass, right? Which you, you talk about the, the gloves and you talk about sanita sanitation stations. All of these things are the details that are necessary to help businesses open back up to be safe and also to inspire customers to feel safe when they come in. And so I appreciate your points. Um, Joe and I have also talked about our plan in terms of the restart package, which is about what we can do to help employers with funds, with federal funds, to rehire workers um, and, and to basically start back up. And knowing that the PPP was helpful, but is like unlikely to get people through and business owners through the entire course of this pandemic. So I really appreciate what you're saying, but the um, because the reality is it's so much bigger than just reopening your doors. All of the things that you're going to need to do in your business, including spacing out the tables, um, the outdoor um, service, so many things that, that a lot of restaurants just were not doing before, and there's an expense associated with doing that now. So thank you for that. Thank you, Regina. Um, we're going to move on to Dulce. Um, many who have gone through college know that it's, it's oftentimes a, a difficult journey to begin with. Um, how is it handling not only the journey of being in college, but now the added financial stress of living this through a global pandemic? Yeah. Um, so I started selling stickers because... <laughs> Um, it, it has not been e easy. My, uh, my mother got laid off, my sister got laid off, my stepfather stopped working too. I was the only one working for the first three months of the pandemic. And on top of that, I have school expenses, which I, as a dreamer, as an undocumented person, I have a very small scope of scholarships that I'm able to even apply for. I cannot get any loans. And so everything up until this past semester, I had paid out of pocket. And, um, and that has been a huge financial toll. And this semester, I started school. And you know I thought, well, because half of the classes are now online, maybe they'll reduce tuition a little bit. They ended up charging us extra um, per credit fee. So um, that was a huge sucker punch, because I fortunate, am very, very fortunate that I was able to keep my job. But I also had to help out more at home. And, um, and now I had extra credits, and, um, and thankfully I'm able to, you know, through my sticker sales, and um, pay for it. But, but um, I have so many classmates who have had to take out huge loans of interest that are so high they probably won't pay it off for 10 years. And I have had friends who, to this day, have not received an ounce of unemployment. And so it, it's, it's, it's so horrible and difficult and it is my last semester this is the last semester where I should be enjoying it going to doing everything possible to enjoy my last few months of college and instead I'm I'm, I'm scared I, I I chalk it up to senioritis and I'm like well you know senioritis I I you know it, it just hit me hard but really it's just this sense of not having any security because the industry that I want to go into is theater Theater has been shut down until at least 2021, and there. And I wanted to go to grad school, but I don't know if that's going to be possible because right now it's very, very difficult to have a sense of hope for the future because I'm not sure if that future exists for me right now. So again, Joe and I have um, a rare, very real concern. So many of our young leaders are coming out of high school, coming out of college, and they don't know if they're going to have any jobs. And for our, our students coming out of college, the debt from student loans. So what Joe and I intend to do is make two-year college free for all students. For students who are coming from a family that makes less than $125,000, four-year college if it's a public school um, or a minor, minority-serving institution will be tuition-free. 
if when you graduate, you take a job that pays less than $125,000, student loan forgiveness, because we want that our bright young students are gonna be able to come out of school and be productive and not be burdened to the point that you don't take on your passion and the thing that excites you and that will make you contribute in such an incredible way to your community. So that's part of um, what we are dealing with. But the other piece of this is also what we must deal with as a general matter around COVID. And in Nevada, we're looking at for Latinos that, that one in four cases of COVID are in the Latino population. That's unacceptable. We're looking at the fact that in Nevada, 75% of the COVID cases in terms of deaths are people who are 65 years and older. So there is also connected with all of these issues, what we need to do to get a handle on the virus. And Joe has given a lot of statements um, about this. Um, he and I are, are, are very clear that we have a president of the United States and Donald Trump who has misled the American people, who has deceived the American people about the seriousness of this virus. He knew it was airborne. Clearly when he was briefed in January, he told somebody in February, we heard him tell them because we heard the tape. He knew it was deadly. And yet still, even most recently here in Nevada, in Henderson, where I have been, he brought thousands of people together and didn't, didn't, wasn't concerned whether or not they were wearing masks or socially distanced. So when I think about the issues that we are gonna to continue to discuss this afternoon, we have to think of it in the context in which we exist right now. And the kind of change that we need, both in terms of supporting small businesses, supporting our students, must happen. And it must happen alongside knowing that the reason that the economy has endured and, and has experienced this kind of pressure, similar to the Great Depression, is because of the public health pandemic, for which Donald Trump has had no plan, and Joe Biden does. And I will add that we know that here, especially in Las Vegas, the majority of our students are working either part-time or full-time. We, you know, we have a large population of the students. And, um, and, and, and talking about Dulce, uh, how have you seen COVID impacting the families you work with, your professors, your fellow students? Um, how do you think it's gonna affect them? Not only right now, not only in the short term, but further down the road. Um, it, how do you think this is um, not only financially, but also mentally? Well, I had my professor just yesterday tell our class, I'm scared of dying because we are having class in person, socially distanced as we can, but he's, he's older. He's, he's in, in that target group that's, that's dying at higher rates and he's terrified of dying and he's teaching us. And so that is a very real fear. I take tests every single, every 11 days because I'm terrified of bringing the virus home to my family because my stepfather is over 65 and is prone, like is in the target group. Um, and I know it, it, it's terrifying. And you know, Latinos are also some of the people that are less likely to go get mental services or mental health resources. And um, there's so much stigma attached to it. So I'm scared that our community specifically from this pandemic is not gonna be able to um, get the help that they need and that this is gonna turn into generational trauma that's gonna affect us for generations. And that's a very, very real fear. Forget the financial stress, which is already insurmount insurmountable. But right now, like, we're, we're struggling mentally and we're, we're the least likely group to get help for it. I agree completely. And um, when we talk about mental health care, we're talking about health care. Like, let's be clear about that. It's, it's too bad that for too long we think of health care and the system talks about health care as though the body starts from the neck down <laughs> instead of understanding the health care we need also from the neck up, right? And, and that's mental health care. And um, so Joe and I, you know, there, again, there's a big contrast here. On the one hand, you have 
We're in the middle of a public health pandemic where over six million people have contracted the virus. Latinos are three times as likely to contract the virus nationally, twice as likely to die from the virus. Over six million people have contracted the virus. Almost 200,000 people have died from the virus. It's a public health crisis. And on the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who right now has his attorney general in the United States Supreme Court trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act that brought health care to tens of millions of people in the midst of a public health pandemic. And when you think about, to the point of your father, pre-existing conditions, if they get rid of the Affordable Care Act, then that means that they'll also get rid of the protections that we got for people with pre-existing conditions. You know those six million people who contracted the virus and you know, through God's grace have lived, we still don't know the long-term health impacts. People are talking about lung scarring, right? Other kinds of um, results of, of having the virus, even if you survive. Well, those will be categorized as pre-existing conditions. So if Donald Trump has his way, the fact that you may be one of those six million people may mean in, in Donald Trump's America, you will not be able to have access to health care that is affordable. So these are some of the issues that are in front of us and, and very much at stake in the next 49 days. And Eddie, uh, how have you and your fellow casino workers um, been impacted by this pandemic? Also, as, a, as a, uh, someone who has young children, um, the fear of going home to them as an essential worker. Thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I'm just glad to be here. And i just like to... Uh, have everybody have a, a minute of peace uh, on the people of uh, silence, I mean, on the people who passed away of COVID, a minute of peace. Thank you so much. Uh, about your question, it's, uh, it's really hard for uh, us essential workers. Uh, construction work, uh, it haven't stopped since the pandemic, pandemic right here in the state. Uh, we have uh, a lot of, uh, probably about almost 7,000 members at the union and everybody was working uh, through, the, through the, uh, the crisis that we have. Uh, the problem that we have now is, the, uh, I believe it's two months ago, uh, Governor Cicillar, he passed a law. The, uh, the, union, uh, the unions cannot, uh, per se, is if you work in a hotel and you get COVID and you passed away, your family not be able to sue the hotel in a sense because the, uh, they, he passed the law on that way to protect the hotels, not the workers. So in a sense, I don't think it's right for, for the people who go uh, and work and get the, uh, the disease and pass away. Uh, and uh, they get and protected. They're not protected for any people on their families. So it's one of the things that I'm worried about that. And um, as a worker right there, uh, pretty much every day that I work, uh, all the, um, uh, the step that we take, we wear a mask, a mask every day, we clean our hands, uh, we take all the precautions that we can to uh, not, not get the virus. Uh, when I get home, uh, when I be get back home, I go to the garage, uh, undress myself, uh, get straight to the shower, and then I wait to go to my family. I just feel like I'm a doctor now. 
so it's one of the steps that we had to leave uh, on the new era that we live in right now. It's pretty difficult sometimes because your kids just want to run uh, to hug you or kiss you or something uh, when you're coming out from the, from the streets. And it's really hard in those moments. Uh, and uh, so one, one of the things that we need to do is just try to do the best of it. And uh, in a sense, when it's really hard when, uh, when someone called you and they said their, uh, their father or mother passed away and they're not seeing them anymore. And uh, in a sense that when they don't have a, a legal papers to be here, they send them to Mexico and they don't have any money for doing that. And it's really hard because uh, you just don't get the strength to the money to help them out on that way. Uh, one of the things, though, they, uh, they help out is, like, if you, we get immigration reform, like uh, you promised at one point in time uh, on, along your career, uh, it will be help a lot of people coming out from the shuttles. Uh, in a sense, uh, they don't come over here to ask for anything. They come over here to have opportunity to live well. A lot of the countries they come from, that's because of fear, not because so they come at the government of the, of the government. So that's what I think uh, we're going through. And I believe uh, you can bring peace, sanity, and justice to the country right here. Well, thank you, Eddie. Um, and for that moment of silence, that was very important. Um, it's been, I think, tragedy that people who hold some of the highest roles of leadership in our country have not acknowledged the number of people who have, who have died, um, so many of whom didn't have their families by their side because of this virus. So thank you for that. I, I think we don't do that enough to have that moment of reflection. Um, in terms of pathway to citizenship, that's one of the first priorities for Joe Biden and myself, a, as we call it, a day one priority, which is to create a pathway for citizenship. Um, to also reinstate DACA and the protections that America made to these hundreds of thousands of young people who are in college, who are living productive lives, who are serving in our military. Um, these are some of the highest priorities. Uh, Joe Biden and I know that we are a nation of immigrants and that we must treat people with dignity and respect. We know that immediately we must end policies that have been about separating children from their parents at the border, policies that have been putting, about putting babies in cages, and we will end those practices. We also are committed that in terms of our response to COVID, that all people, regardless of immigrant status, will have free access to treatment, to testing, and God willing, when we have a safe vaccine, to the vaccine. We are also committed to shutting down the private detention centers. We all heard the stories about what's going on in, in Georgia with hysterectomies of women. Um, so these are the, the pledges that I make to you in terms of some of the highest priorities for Joe Biden and myself. Gracias, senadora, y I'm going to say it in Spanish. Es, es muy importante para nuestras familias escuchar esto en estos momentos porque muchos estamos batallando. Muchos están en momentos difíciles que no, no se ve una salida y en este momento tener un líder es lo que se necesita. So I said, uh, right now our families are struggling and, and we need a leader that's, that's going to come through for our family. So thank you for saying that. Y con eso... Oh, I went into Spanish. <laughs> um, Councilwoman Diaz, um, in our community, um, we know our community that's, that's outside of these doors, um, what has been the impact? What have you seen? Um, and also, how has our community grown from this? There's a lot of negative, but what has been the moments that our community has come together to have uh, a support for each other? Well, thank you, Astrid. Um, never in a million years would I have thought when I was running for this office that I was going to face a pandemic in my community. And uh, but it it really truly makes you make sure that you stay focused on why you ran for that office, which is to help 
and protect and serve the people that elected you. Um, in Ward 3, I've had the uh, fortune of having community members step up and help us shoulder this weight called COVID-19 in terms of advocacy work in our community. Uh, because we were seeing different things happening at different angles, we started to communicate with each other and we came up with uh, Están Tus Manos campaign, which is um, you know, PSAs, making sure people knew about where to get tested. We are offering free tests to the entire community, regardless of having insurance or not. Uh, making sure that they knew what the three W's were in terms of wearing a mask, washing their hands, and washing their distance. And we're continuing that work um, because every day it seems like you just have to hammer it home, hammer it home, just constantly. Um, but then, you know, there's been some very difficult, heavy times when you get those pleas for help and your phone rings and um, they're at their end of the rope. They don't have a way to pay their rent. They don't have a way to provide for their family. And that's what they want to do. They want to have a job so that they can purchase their groceries so that they don't have to go to the food distribution points or sites that we have here. Um, for us Latinos, it's about dignity and being proud of being able to provide. And it's been really, really tough um, because not everybody was included in the stimulus package. Not everybody was able to receive unemployment, even though they worked hard every single day up to the shutdown. <laughs> And, you know, they continue to have to work. And then we, then the, our, our, you know, we frown upon our positivity rates. Well, I'm sorry, but when you have no other choice but to go out and put yourself in the line of duty to provide for your families, COVID-19 is not going to be that relevant to you because you want to provide for your family and you want to provide that sense of security for them. And you're the, you're the pillar that's holding up that household. So... It's been incredibly humbling. It's been incredibly um, difficult to uh, receive all of these stories and try to connect people to resources. But, you know, I've tried to make sure that I'm following what the SBA is doing to help small business owners like Regina and get the word out in Spanish. And, Senator, it's so incredibly, uh, you come from California where I think you guys have had a, uh, you know, better practice of being more multiculturally aware and diverse in terms of language access, but geez, it's, it's been people like Astrid, La Casa del Migrante, other um, Latino community stakeholders who have been trying to convey the message in Spanish. And, you know, we're the largest minority group, yet we don't get the information at the same rate nor at the same time as everybody else. And sometimes our community needs that information sooner. Um, or just at the same rate too, to, to, to protect us because we are facing some disparities in terms of quality access and health, access to healthcare. A lot of people don't have it. And so a fear is why should I go get tested if I'm gonna get, be positive, yet I don't even know how I'm gonna be able to afford treatment um, if it does, if I don't, you know, if my situation with COVID gets worse and I land in a hospital, then how do I, afford that treatment. So we want more federal dollars to help our folks here on the ground. I think local governments have a lot of nimbleness and flexibility. Um, the monies that were allocated to us, we went through them so quickly, like the rental assistance. We're really scared about what September, after the governor put in you know, 45 more days of a rent moratorium, but what will happen if we don't get money into the hands of the people who need that money to pay that rent. We don't want to see our homelessness rates exacerbated or increased. We want our kids that are having to deal with virtual schooling. My nine-year-old, every day he'll ask me, when can I go back to school, mom? And I have to hear him out. He's frustrated that he can't be in a brick and mortar school. Um, and just, you know, it's not fair to be struggling with connectivity issues and virtual schooling. And on top of that, not even knowing that if you're going to be able to reside or keep the home you have. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of needs, um, a lot of employment needs, a lot of health care needs, a lot of assistance that we need to provide because in Las Vegas, 
we do rely heavily on the hotel casino corridor and the convention spaces to keep our economy going. And I think it's very crucial for that to be recognized that our economy is not built or created equal to other economies where manufacturing jobs exist, with where other type of industry exists. And you know, I'm I'm just trying to make sure that I can continue to feed rope to people who call me and then I say, don't lose hope. We have this for you while we get you on to your back on your feet. We have this other option and and we need that leader that will continue to give us um, the, that continue that continued support to keep supporting our our community. First, I just want to thank you. Um, this is what real leadership looks like. And we've seen so many displays of a lack of leadership, but real leadership is about seeing the people, caring about the people, and truly wanting to help the people. Um, I think the greatest sign of strength is not based on who you beat down, it's based on who you lift up, especially when they're in a time of need. So I, I'm going to talk about the school issue. You, you talked about many things, and, and that's about what we need to do to expand the unemployment piece. Um, there is a component, I, for example, was with the culinary workers just a couple of days ago. Eighty-something percent of them are still out of work. At the height of the pandemic, 98% were out of work. Um, and so part of the plan that Joe and I have includes extending unemployment and also health coverage so that we would pay 100% for COBRA benefits during that period. Um, but the school piece is another piece of it because when we look at essential workers, we should not treat them as sacrificial workers, to your point. So many... Um, of the frontline workers are women, people of color, and immigrants who have been going to work every day to take care of other people's children or seniors or to be on the front lines working in the hospitals at every level of what that hospital requires to function. And yet they don't have paid family leave or paid sick leave. Um, you know, yet they don't have affordable child care so that they can go to work and be safe and let their children be safe. And those are part of the, the child care piece as well as expanding the caregiving workforce is one of the great priorities for Joe Biden and myself. But making sure that for those jobs, that they are well-paid jobs, that those are union jobs, that those are jobs where people are paid with the dignity that they deserve for the work and the value of the work they are performing. Um, but in terms of schools and all of that, the other piece of it, it's about the need to build up infrastructure. And a large part of our, our initiative about building back up the economy is also about building back up infrastructure, including our schools. Some of the reasons that some of our children cannot go back to school is for our public schools, those buildings are so old. None of us would let our children drink from the water fountain because that water is pretty much toxic. And the ventilation system in so many of the buildings is so bad that they can't even be indoors, even if they're socially distanced, and be safe. So these are some of the areas of priority that he and I have that are about not only addressing what this pandemic has made clear are the problems with what was before the pandemic hit, but also what we need to do to build back better, as we say. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. And I think what, what comes down to all the things that we're hearing is we're willing to work on solutions. Our community, our business leaders, our students, our elected officials, our workers, we're all here, we're ready to be at a table. We just need to have leadership that is willing to take science, that is willing to take all of the needed pieces to give us a better a better uh, future. And, and not even a future at this point, an outcome to something that nobody signed up for. Nobody, um, I, don't, I, I don't think we can find anybody at this point that um, thinks that this is uh, something that, you know, was going to be better for all of us. Our communities are hurting, um, and, and, and especially here in our, in our city um, with Councilwoman, you know, we play back and forth where organizations send them to her and she sends them back to the organizations because there's no resources. Um, you know, we can help people get to a, a food bank. We can get help pe to people 
but then what about the next week and the next week? Um, and, and finding out you know, that community members are choosing to forego paying their rent because they're gonna pay their energy bill because they need energy for their kids to be in online classes. Finding out that you know the internet isn't working in mostly our communities, mostly our low-income Latino black communities, our students need this because they're our future. They're the ones that are, are going to come out, out of all of this. And Councilwoman, I, I don't think there's any more words that can echo what is happening in our communities. And we want to make sure that you take this back with you, that you help, not help to fix this, not help to resolve this, but that you understand that our communities are here. We're ready. We want to work for this, but we just need to make sure there's a leader that's going to actually be able to help us. I couldn't agree with you more, Astrid. Um, and leadership, again, is about the strength of a leader is, I think we all agree, defined by who you lift up. And that requires that you see the people, you listen to the people, you care about the people, um, you care about truth. To your point, you care about science, especially when you're in the middle of a public health pandemic. Um, and that's the kind of leader Joe Biden is. We are 49 days away from the election. This election is really gonna matter. It's really gonna matter. There are clear choices. On the issue again of the COVID, on the one hand, you have a Donald Trump who's trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act and protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Can you believe that? On the other hand, you have a Joe Biden who wants to expand health coverage, including mental health coverage. Um, on the one hand, you have a Donald Trump who has been talking about building a wall and sowing hate and division in our country and belittling the significance of our history of, of immigrants helping to build the country into what it is. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden who says that on day one, one of his highest priorities is putting in place a pathway towards citizenship. On one hand, you have Donald Trump who had a policy about putting babies in cages and separating children from their parents at the border. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden saying he will end that. And I can go on and on down the list. On the one hand, you have Donald Trump who knew in January that this thing that would end up kill, killing almost 200,000 people and causing over 6 million people to become sick, he knew how bad it was? And played politics with the American people, including saying, you know, he might as well have said, you know, if you wear a mask, you're a, not a strong person. <laughs> when in fact we know that it's one of the best ways we can save lives. There are clear choices in this election. And so I urge everyone to, um, here in Nevada, vote and vote early. Um, Nevada early voting begins October 17th through October 30th. We want to encourage everyone to vote early. It really matters. And, you know, there are all kinds of fear tactics that Donald Trump is trying to push in, in many communities and, and with a particular emphasis on the immigrant community and trying to create fear, trying to create distrust. And I would urge everyone to sit back and think, why is he trying to put in place all these obstacles to having people vote? Why, is this, why go through the effort? What is that about? And I'll tell you what I believe the answer is. Because he knows that when people vote, things change. And so let that be a reminder to us about the power of our vote. It's so powerful that some people would put in place all these obstacles to prevent us from voting. So my last point is, don't ever let anybody take your power from you. 
Bueno. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Senator. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing what's happening in our community, in our homes, in our small businesses. Um, thank you um, for, for sharing all of those stories. And um, adelante, that's all we can, that's, we can only move forward. Thank you. Thank you.